Hi everyone. We're gonna we're gonna start up pretty soon. Wait for a couple more people to, to join us. Okay, I think we can we can get started. We'll wait for the music to go away. Welcome everyone. My name is John Pfeffer. I'm uh, the Director of Foreign Policy and Focus at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, DC. And we are a think tank um, located in the capital of the United States, a progressive think tank that connects social movements to policymaking. Uh, and we have a strong foreign policy uh, component to our work, which includes a project we call the Global Just Transition, which looks at Green New Deals and similar initiatives around the world and also looks at the impact at the multilateral level and particularly the impact uh, on the global south. Um, I would like to welcome you to our, I think it's our fifth uh, session in this series. Uh, we looked at the Green New Deal in Europe and in South Korea, and we've looked at uh, the situation in Russia. And also we held a, uh, panel discussion on a just transition in Latin America. But today we are looking at India and the future of the planet. And I'm delighted to uh, be joined by three prominent um, specialists on this question. And I'm going to uh, introduce them pretty quickly here. And then before each of them speaks, I'll give a, a longer introduction and then of course put their uh, bios in the chat as well. Uh, the structure of our discussion today, we'll have three presentations, the last 10 to 15 minutes, which will give us plenty of time for dialogue uh, among the participants and take your questions as well and comments. Uh, if you have uh, questions, I would recommend you put them in the Q&A function. Uh, if you have comments, of course, put them in the chat. Uh, we'd also love to hear uh, where you're coming from. So if you want to introduce yourself in the chat and just say quickly um, where you're, you're tuning in from, that would be lovely. Um, and this, this will last for about 90 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to also put uh, some more information about our Global Just Transition Project in the chat along with a, a link so you can see our reports and sign up for our next uh, seminar, which will look again at the impact of Green New Deals on uh, Global South, especially in Latin America. But uh, today um, we are going to look at India and I'm joined by Jayati Ghosh, uh, Ashish Kotari, and Basaf Sen. 
Um, we're going to go in the order in, that was listed in the announcement, uh, Jayati Ghosh uh, beginning. Um, and I'm really delighted to, to welcome Jayati Ghosh, not only to, to this, this discussion, but of course to the United States, uh, because she is now teaching at Amherst. Uh, she, she taught economics at, uh, at Jawaharlal Nehru University for 35 years. Um, and then just this last month, uh, came to the United States to start teaching at Amherst. Um, she's authored or edited 19 books, uh, and I'll include some of those, of course, in, in the chat. Um, she's received several prizes, uh, including for distinguished contributions to the social sciences in India in 2015, as well as the International Labor Organization's Decent Work Research Prize for 2010. Um, She's advised governments in India and other countries, including as chairperson of the Andhra Pradesh Commission on Farmers' Welfare in 2004. Uh, and she's a member of the National Knowledge Commission of India from 2005 to 2009. And then finally, she's the Executive Secretary of International Development Economics Associates, an international network of heterodox development economists. So welcome, Jayati. It's wonderful to see you here. Thank you so much. It's actually a great pleasure to be part of this and with such a distinguished uh, set of colleagues uh, to be able to discuss these issues. And I'm actually just going to start off uh, by highlighting what I think is um, correct about the Indian government's position on climate change and what is very, very wrong and why in the end, uh, the current policy direction of India is exactly the opposite of a Green New Deal. It is uh, neither new, that's not a deal, and it's not green in any form. However, let me just begin by pointing out that many of the criticisms that the Indian government has made internationally about the way in which the climate negotiations are going on and the way in which the entire construct of alleviating climate change has been constructed globally is wrong, unjust, and unlikely to succeed in any way. Because there's no doubt that advanced economies have been not just exploitative and hypocritical in many ways, they are also continuing to be deeply unjust, and I would argue actively hindering uh, the, any attempts at climate alleviation. How is this? Well, uh, and this I'm speaking now of the governments of developed countries, recognizing that within developed countries, there is a lot of inequality and there are many voices, popular voices, demanding much better and progressive changes. So there is, of course, the issue of per capita emissions, where the United States, of course, leads the pack hugely, I mean, 32 times the median of the rest of the world uh, in terms of per capita emissions, but also uh, the fact of the carbon debt historically, the European nations and the United States and Japan, currently advanced nations, have appropriated uh, huge amounts of the emissions of the past, which really makes them the dominant reason why we are facing the climate change that we have today. Uh, they also, according to the current climate uh, strategies, will continue to do so into the foreseeable future, because all of these grandiose claims of zero emissions by 2050 and so on uh, are really um, assuming that they will continue to appropriate the, the lion's share of the carbon budget, 65 to 70%, when they account for less than 20% of the global population. So there is huge hypocrisy there. But in addition, there is massively insufficient climate finance for both mitigation and adaptation. Even the pitiful amount of $100 billion a year promised by all advanced countries put together to the developing world, even that pitiful amount has not been reached. This was promised in 2012, nearly a decade later, we're nowhere near uh, that amount even per year. And this is even at a time when, you know, when they want, it's very clear advanced country governments can pull money out of a hat and can spend vast quantities, trillions and trillions on themselves without even this tiny little amount, which is absolutely necessary to save the planet. But then of course, there is the uh, possibly even more critical issue of the control over knowledge and the fact that intellectual property rights monopolies are being enabled and used uh, to privilege corporations based in the North 
and to deny developing countries and producers in the developing countries the essential technology that would allow them to both mitigate and alleviate climate change. And it's not just that uh, these monopolies, which frankly are bad for humanity, they're not just bad for the developing world, they're bad for everybody because they add to the problems that we are unable to deal with. It's not just the fact of these monopolies, it is that then when developing countries attempt to provide their own subsidies, develop their own knowledge, which is frankly unnecessary, ridiculous, you're reinventing the wheel, but nonetheless, they have to do that. When they try and do that, then they face trade sanctions in the WTO, which I regret to say are often bought, uh, instigated by unions in the developed countries. So China, the US, when they have tried, that China and India, when they have tried to give subsidies for solar and wind energy and so on, they have faced trade um, uh, cases, dispute settlement in the WTO led by the United States and the European Union. So there are many ways in which the advanced countries are not just hypocritical and unjust, but are really counterproductive in this whole uh, massive uh, thing that we are facing as humanity. Having said all that, can, does this mean that everything the Indian government is doing is therefore justified? For example, in the latest uh, Glasgow talks, the uh, declaration that they will not make a commitment to reduce coal and so on. Uh, the problem here is really that it's not just inequality between countries, it's also inequality within countries. And I, I think we really have to recognize this. And India is a very stark example, not just of high inequality, but dramatically increased inequality in the last two, three decades. The, uh, the World Inequality Report uh, brought out by Luca Chancel and Thomas Piketty uh, and others uh, from the Paris Inequality Lab. It's a very interesting document. The latest report actually tells us about carbon inequality, emissions inequality within countries as well as between countries. And what's very striking is that the top 10% in India, in fact, the top 1% in India are massive emitters, okay? Just as the average for India is two megatons of a carbon per year per person. And for the very poor, for the bottom half of the population, it is 0 0.4. So it's minuscule, very, very little uh, carbon emissions per capita. The top 1% emits 32 megatons per capita per year, which is three times the bottom half of the European Union's population. It, sorry, six times what the European Union's bottom, the poorer half emit. It's three times what the, Europe, the United States bottom half emits. So there is a lot of inequality within India. So the average of two that we are constantly presenting to the world represents a, 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 um, a configuration whereby the poor are not just emitting very little carbon, but are reducing their carbon emissions over time for many reasons. The rich, on the other hand, are dramatically multiplying their carbon emissions in India. And they are enabled to do so, not only by a government that is celebrating inequality, generating more forces for inequality and so on, but by a range of environmental deregulation. So we have a government that is actually handing out more coal licenses, granting many more environmental freedoms, uh, ability to pollute, ability to deforest, ability to grab land, ability to destroy the environment in many, many ways two large corporations, all in the attempt uh, to attract private investment. We have um, essentially massive increases of fiscal subsidies and financial policies, which actively promote brown investment and very, very insufficient public investment, almost nothing compared to what is required in terms of subsidizing, promoting, encouraging, enabling the green investments that we need. And this is a pity and it's a tragedy because these green investments could generate much more employment, could generate better well-being, and obviously will improve the conditions of those who are the worst losers from climate change, many of whom reside in India. So it's the opposite of a Green New Deal. But the reason for this is really the reason why we have the global inequality. It's the same class forces operating within India that are operating globally. If you like, it's, it's capitalism rearing its ugly head in both places. But it's not just any old capitalism. It's untrammeled, deregulated, neoliberal capitalism, hand in hand with the state, which is doing this and which is destroying not just our planet, but the lives of people who are affected by climate change even today.
Okay, let me stop here. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Jayati. That was an excellent overview and, and a sobering overview, of course, as well. Um, and we will, of course, return to a number of these, these questions about uh, the performance of the Indian government and its comparative um, status uh, with other countries around the world in terms of emissions. But I, I think also very interesting the, the, the statistics you cited about um, the difference within India of the carbon footprint of, of different economic um, uh, layers of, this, of society. We turn now to Ashish Kotari, um, and Ashish is an Indian environmentalist working on development environment interface, biodiversity policy and alternatives. He's one of the founders of Kal, uh, Kalpavriksh, and I know I've mispronounced that, so perhaps you can, you can correct my pronunciation. But that's a nonprofit organization in India, which deals with environmental and development issues. He's been associated with people's movements like Narmada Bachao Andolan and Bij Bachao Andolan. Katari has also been a teacher of environment at Indian Institute of Public Administration in New Delhi. And he's been a member of the steering committees of the World Commission on Protective Areas and the IUCN Commission on Environmental, Economic and Social Policy from 98 to 2008. In 2019, he co-created the Global Tapestry of Alternatives process and he has authored and co-authored several books on India's environment, birds, and biodiversity. And so Ashish, you're, I think, going to give us a, a, another view of what's going on in India um, from perhaps the grassroots level as well. So over to you. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks to you and IPS and everybody else who's been a part of organizing this. Thanks for the opportunity. Great to be here. Uh, and it's also great, of course, to follow up on uh, Jayati because uh, I totally agree with everything she said. And it's uh, it helps not to have to uh, redo that part of the argument. So I'll try and sort of build on it. Um, unlike Jayati, I'm not as articulate without uh, pictures. So I'm going to be showing some slides. OK, um, right. So. Uh, if we actually look at, uh, I mean, this, if you look at the sort of last 30, 40 years of what is called development in India, as in most of the global south, um, of course, it's, it's brought benefits to a certain section of the population, but it's also brought immense amounts of violence against uh, nature, as you see in this advertisement, and against communities, especially those who are most heavily dependent on land, on forests, on water, on uh, coastal areas, etc., for their livelihood and their sustenance. And I call this actually a move from uh, livelihoods that were sort of encompassed within ecological cultural systems to deadlyhoods where those are being increasingly destroyed and we're creating jobs, some jobs in the so-called modern sector, which are largely uncreative and uh, soul deadening. But we're also seeing that in this process of, you know, this whole uh, single minded approach to looking at, we must have 8%, 10% economic growth. Uh, that everything else is shoved aside, and that includes democratic rights, because when people protest on the ground, and I'll speak a little bit about that in a minute, um, increasingly, they're not just being called anti-development, which used to be the case, but now it's being equated to also being anti-national, secessionist, terrorist, etc. And we've actually seen in the last couple of years, more and more people, uh, especially including young, very young people, being targeted uh, uh, with the use of repressive laws, um, being called uh, seditionist and so on. We're also seeing, as Jayati rightly pointed out, a significant dilution of environmental regulations, labor regulations, uh, and also increasingly all of this is getting mixed up with the politics of religious hate. Uh, and it's really a toxic mixture that we're actually beginning to see in India as in many other parts of the world. And then if you see the last couple of years of uh, the sorts of budgets that the government has been announcing, including the latest one yesterday, um, there's a lot of double speak involved in this. So, you know, our prime minister said a year and a half back that COVID has taught us to be self-reliant, but the self-reliance that they're talking about is actually increasing coal mining, uh, bringing in mega solar uh, projects and so on in the name of clean energy, and essentially, again, uh, dispossessing and displacing and land grabbing of all kinds. Um, and in fact, if you look at the budgets also, there's virtually nothing on climate adaptation, though, as we know, 
India, uh, there are hundreds of millions of people in India who are already facing or will be facing very serious impacts because of climate. Now, the question that arises is, are there alternatives? Do we have other pathways that are available to us which don't go down this road of ecological ruin and social inequality and so on? And I would say, yes, there are. If you look at grassroots responses in India, uh, as elsewhere in the global south, one is resistance. People saying, uh, no, enough is enough. We are not going to take this uh, lying down. We have seen, of course, the fantastic mobilization by farmers in the last one year. Uh, we're seeing mobilization by young people, including through using art as a form of protest. We're seeing mobilization by uh, people, by communities doing uh, against mining or other forms of extractivism, uh, women's mobilization, youth mobilization, many different kinds of things. And here, what they're actually talking about is not simply that we're against this project and that project and so on, but actually against the structures of oppression and domination and unsustainability, which includes capitalism, but also state domination, patriarchy, racism, et cetera. And increasingly also saying that we also need to live lives that are in respect to the rest of nature, not just centered around uh, the human uh, itself. But the other kind of alternatives we're seeing increasingly in the, on the ground are uh, constructive alternatives where people are trying to meet their basic needs and aspirations uh, in different fields uh, in ways that are ecologically sensitive and also socially sensitive and equitable. Just to give you a couple of quick examples, um, this is uh, 5,000 Dalit women farmers. Dalits are the so-called outcasts or used to be called the untouchables of Hindu, Hindu society. The most marginalized section of India's population as Dalits and as women. Uh, in the last 30 years, they've actually revived a lot of their traditional forms of agriculture, brought back a diversity of local seeds, completely organic, collectivized a lot of their operations, shared knowledge, shared seeds, etc., fought for land rights for women, and much else, and created not just food security, but actually food sovereignty, uh, which means full control over everything to do with food. And of course, their agriculture is much more climate resilient than what the green revolution that has been promoted by the government. Uh, in central India, this is indigenous, uh, a part of indigenous India where 90 villages have got together to stop mining operations, but also to assert their identity as Adivasis or indigenous people, to uh, take control over the forest, to protect the forest, but also use it sustainably for livelihoods and create economic and, and uh, political systems which are much more in their own control. With the slogan that democracy is not just about going to elections, but it's really us taking decisions where we are. We are the government in our villages. And I'll come back to that about the, the form of democracy and what that means. We've done a documentation of about 65, 70 examples from around India of where uh, completely counter to what was happening in the rest of India. There are communities that survived, not just survived, but actually thrived through the COVID pandemic and the lockdown period, um, and why that was the case. How did they actually manage to have not just enough to eat, but also secure livelihoods, secure health, and so on. There's some fascinating uh, lessons that we can learn from these, uh, from these examples. Um, the second, uh, another kind of response, of course, so there's a resistance, there's the constructive alternatives. And there's also then, of course, demanding accountability from the state. Um, that is part of the sort of grassroots movements that we're seeing, as a result of which at least some progressive laws and programs have come up in the last uh, few two, three decades, uh, which enable greater uh, participation, greater uh, possibilities for people to secure livelihoods, uh, the environment, etc. Now, um, what we've also done then in the last few years is to kind of work with a lot of these communities to look at what are the sorts of overall frameworks of alternatives that are emerging. It's not just these individual examples, but what does it mean for society as a whole? And I mean, I don't have the time to go into all of this right now, but essentially we're seeing transformations in five spheres of life, the political, the economic, the social, the cultural, and the ecological. Of course, all integrated and interrelated. In the democratic, in the political, for instance, as I said, Democracy meaning we are part of, we are central to decision-making wherever we are, in an urban neighborhood, in a village, in an institution, et cetera. Economic democracy meaning that workers actually take full control over the means of production. There's much more local self-reliance for basic needs, there's much more localized exchange, uh, et cetera, and the economy of caring and sharing. Social justice, of course, because we have both traditional and new forms of inequalities of uh, all kinds, casteism being particularly unique to India. 
um, which have to be fought against uh, in terms of struggles for equality and justice. Um, the assertion of uh, the commons in terms of knowledge and, and uh, culture, um, Jayati rightly pointed out uh, the problems with intellectual property rights. So here these movements are actually saying that knowledge should be in the commons and not privatized, just like property or land or forest should be in the commons, not privatized. And also that the diversity of language and culture and uh, knowledge is as important. And finally, of course, the fundamentals of uh, sustaining the ecological processes. What I find most fascinating about these grassroots initiatives, resistance and alternatives is that they're coming up with, a, with sets of values articulated sometimes, uh, not explicitly, but implicitly of uh, ethics and values and principles that are so completely opposed to what our currently dominant economic and political system tells us. Just to give you one flavor of this, it's about cooperation, not competition. It's about the collective and the individual, not just individual selfishness. It's about the commons, not the privatized. Uh, and many, many others. Um, it's about not just human rights, but also the rights of the rest of nature. And I think this is really what kind of, uh, in a sense, um, threads India with the rest of the world together. Because what we see is that in India, if we think of this as what some of us have called ecological, uh, radical ecological democracy or eco Swaraj, which means, as I said, we are, in, we are the decision makers wherever we are. But when we take those decisions, it's not the American way where you know, I, ha I have freedom to go and do whatever I want in the world. And that's my notion of freedom. It's such that I have freedom. Our community has freedom, but in responsibility to your freedom, your happiness, your well-being, which means that there has to be a social and an ecological responsibility built into that uh, decision-making process. And we have, of course, similar things happening in many other parts of the world, um, similar notions, similar worldviews, practices, et cetera. And I think it's this sort of set of ethics that kind of, in a way, uh, where, where I think there's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from India, but also that India can learn from the rest of the world. Um, and so combining all of this, what I think is that we need to be able to go, I think the Green New Deals are, are good. They're certainly much better than the conventional uh, forms of economics, et cetera, but they're still uh, limited. They still do not have an adequate notion of global North-South uh, equality, the sorts of issues that Jayati uh, raised. Uh, and so we need to go beyond that in terms of looking at multiple different revolutions. And I'm calling that a rainbow new deal as we emerge out of COVID, which includes sustainability, justice, equality, equity, and so on and so forth. Um, two processes that I'll mention, and then I'll end, that try and bring a lot of this together in terms of the movements, the organizations, and so on. In India, there's Vikalp Sangam, or the confluence of alternatives, trying to create sharing spaces, collaborations, more of a critical mass for advocacy and uh, change, macro change. And then globally, we have the global tapestry, trying to create a sort of a horizontal platform of uh, resistance and alternative movements coming together again for sharing, for more of a critical mass, for collective global actions, et cetera. There's many books uh, that I'll point out. I can put some things in the chat later on, maybe some links. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. Um, Excellent. Happy to be part of this discussion afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Ashish. That was wonderful. You, you've given us not only a, a, a view from the grassroots and some examples of, of resistance and some alternatives, but also fitting that into the larger tapestry, the tapestry of alternatives, as well as the rainbow uh, New Deal, which I think is a, it would be wonderful if we could somehow change the conversation about Green New Deal so that they are not just a single color, as you point out, um, but should reflect the rainbow of alternatives and the rainbow of, uh, of approaches that we all support. Um, I'd like to turn now to uh, Basaf Sen. And, and before I introduce Basaf, I, I just want to um, emphasize that uh, we have a Q&A uh, function here. And if you have questions, um, please put them there. We already have one, so that's wonderful. And we'll, we'll get to that question as soon as we move to that part of this uh, of this uh, event. Um, but uh, one last presentation from my colleague at the Institute for Policy Studies, Basaf Sen, and I'm de delighted to be sharing the stage with him. Um, Basaf joined us at the Institute as the Climate Justice Project Director in February 2017. 
His work focuses on climate solutions at the national, state, and local level that address racial, economic, gender, and other forms of inequality. Before he joined IPS, Basaf worked for about 11 years as a strategic corporate campaign researcher at the United Food and Commercial Workers uh, Union. He has also had experience as a campaigner on the World Bank, the IMF, and global finance and trade issues. As a member of grassroots neighborhood-based environmental groups, he has been involved in local struggles on energy justice here in Washington, DC. And his most recent report, which I, I highly recommend, you can find it, at, I'll, I'll put a link in the, in the chat, is on how the US transportation system fuels inequality. So Basaf, I think you're gonna put this into the geopolitical context for us, and I'm turning it over to you. Thank you for that introduction, John. And it's really a pleasure to be uh, sharing this panel with uh, uh, presenters like Jayati and Ashish. And um, um, I'm almost thinking maybe I should have gone second and had Ashish go at the end because uh, Ashish's presentation was so hopeful. Uh, it was, you know, it it filled me with hope just to watch it, uh, just to see the the range of creativity uh, of you know grassroots movements, just just the beautiful diversity of ideas and the way you um, described it as the articulation of uh, core values. Um, now the subject that I've been assigned to speak on. Uh, which is energy transition in India in a global context is so vast that initially I was having trouble uh, narrowing it down to something I could reasonably cover in 10 to 15 minutes. Now, thankfully, uh, John, when he came up with the event description, uh, put three questions for you know uh, people to think about and. I, I latched onto them as the perfect way to um, sort of condense my thoughts into uh, what could fit into 10 to 15 minutes. And the questions I'm paraphrasing slightly here are, uh, so is India a threat to the world in terms of climate change? The short answer is no. Uh, is India making a good faith effort to transition its energy system? The answer again is no. And is India standing up for the world's poor and dispossessed? Uh, and the answer, if you look beyond the re rhetoric, once again, is no. <laughs> let me, you know, let me um, elaborate on all three of these. Uh, so on the first point, um, uh, as Jayati mentioned very articulately, uh, that the entire, you know, um, uh, discourse around blaming uh, countries in the global south and particularly some countries that are, you know, um, uh, somewhat more better off in the global south like China and India for being the drivers of climate change is completely disingenuous. And um, let me put some concrete numbers on that. Uh, and I'm comparing India and the United States here partly because, uh, well, I'm sitting in the United States, uh, probably a sizable chunk of our audience is from the United States and IPS is a US institution. And the US is one of the world's largest economies, etc. So um, India's per capita GDP is about 1 30th of the US. Uh, India's um, uh, per capita greenhouse gas emissions are about 1 8th. And um, and um, uh, India's cumulative greenhouse gas emissions since the start of the industrial revolution about uh, is about one sixth 
of the United States. So um, uh, just from a very kind of obvious level of just what conclusions you can draw from the numbers, clearly there are many other countries in the global north who are disproportionately the ones who have driven the climate crisis that much of that the entire world is um, confronting today um and a lot of the discourse around blaming india in particular came out of uh, this thing that happened during the last un climate talks the cop 26 in scotland uh, last November, where there was a declaration that for the first time ever in the entire history of the UN climate talks mentioned fossil fuels. Uh, and it ended up uh, with mentioning only coal as against oil and gas. And India uh, was the you know, the leading voice uh, publicly opposing that, uh, opposing that statement. And some people uncritically started blaming India for the failure to mention fossil fuels in uh, the UN climate talks. But just to put a few things in perspective here, uh, number one, why is it that the UN climate talk started in 1992, and it took 30 years to even mention the elephant in the room, uh, namely fossil fuels. Was that India's fault or uh, was that collectively the fault of much of the rest of the world, including uh, the most economically and politically powerful countries? So that's number one. Uh, number two, why only mention coal? Uh, particularly if you look at the impact of natural gas or fossil gas, as I prefer to call it, over its life cycle, it is just about as bad as coal in terms of greenhouse gas emissions because uh, you have to account for the leakage of methane from the production of gas and the leaks of methane that occur from the pipeline system, et cetera. And Methane is about 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide uh, as a greenhouse gas over a short window of time, over about 20 years. And there has been a tremendous spike in emissions of methane worldwide, thanks to the so-called fracking revolution or uh, you know, unconventional drilling uh, revolution that was led by the United States. And um, uh, so clearly some countries, particularly large producers of oil and gas had a strategic interest in not mentioning oil and gas in uh, whatever um, agreement, whatever language came out of COP26. And maybe we should also look at who those countries are uh, if we were really to assign blame in a fair way for why COP26 failed to um, address fossil fuels. And of course, by far the largest producer of oil and gas in the world is the United States. Uh, about as much as the next two countries, Saudi Arabia and Russia combined. Uh, also the fastest growing production of oil and gas in the world is in the United States and much of it from just a few key oil and gas producing regions like the Permian Basin in West Texas. Um, so, Yes, if we were to actually dig beyond some superficial headlines and look at underlying facts, India is not the major threat to the world in terms of climate change. However, who is India's energy model a threat to? It's a threat to people in India. It's a threat to people in Indian cities who are breathing some of the most polluted air in the world. Um, 
the Indian capital, Delhi, and some of its key suburbs are the most polluted cities in the world. Uh, and you know, one little headline that those of us who follow the issues noticed uh, is that in the week after COP26, uh, a few power plants in the proximity of Delhi got shut down because of an air quality emergency. Uh, which, you know, which goes to show how serious the problem of air pollution in India is. Uh, and it's not just the cities. What about people in rural India, disproportionately indigenous peoples, Adivasis, who are losing their land, losing access to their livelihoods uh, because of expansion of coal mining in India? Um, or for that matter, other kinds of uh, heavy industry, you know, metal ores, mining, um, um, big dams, etc. cetera. Um, so, uh, so clearly while India's economic model and energy production model is not a threat to the world, it is a threat to people in India, particularly to some of the most marginalized people within India. And that's, that's a perspective we have to keep in mind. And I would urge all listeners to really pay attention to the demands of social movements in India and to recognize that uh, movements in India need global solidarity, uh, much like movements in many other parts of the world. Uh, so, so then is India making a good faith effort to transition its energy system? Uh, very quickly, the answer is no. Uh, first of all, India's target for zero emissions, and it's not even zero emissions, it's net zero emissions, and I'll come to that in a minute, uh, is 2070, and that's clearly inadequate. Uh, the somewhat conservative global scientific body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, even they recognize that the world has to get to zero emissions by 2050. And so 2070 is clearly you know, way out there. And also, if you set a target that far in the future, that's the perfect excuse for policymakers to not do anything today. Uh, because, you know, with a target that far in the future, you can say, oh yeah, we, we'll get to that. For now, we just have to keep up with business as usual, uh, which is clearly what's going on here. Uh, and also the framework of net zero is inherently problematic uh, because it makes this assumption that we can keep on polluting as long as we deal with that pollution in some other way. And those some other ways either don't exist or are profoundly unjust. Uh, so, so what are the some other ways that people talk about when they say net zero emissions? Uh, they say that we can keep on emitting if we can plant thousands of trees somewhere else uh, without addressing the fact that if we keep on producing greenhouse gases, that will also mean continued emissions of particulate matters and sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides and other air toxins, which will keep poisoning the people in the vicinity of where you are spewing out the smoke. And it will also mean violations of land rights for people where you are planting those trees, you know, whose land, whose livelihoods are you taking away by planting those trees? Uh, and are those the right kind of trees to plant anyway, or will they be invasive species? Will they affect, uh, you know, uh, groundwater, et cetera, if they are commercial tree plantations, which are just, you know, going to enrich some people at the, ex you know, using the excuse of a carbon offset. Another way which people you know, who proclaim net zero say that they will deal with uh, these emissions that will keep happening uh, is machines to suck carbon dioxide out of 
the sky. And, and I'm not making that up, that that's actually a proposal that's out there. Uh, and uh, that's on the face of it absurd because uh, you're going to spend a massive amount of capital and a massive amount of energy to suck a trace gas out of the atmosphere because you're not willing to, to make the hard political decisions. Uh, to wind down a polluting industry, namely fossil fuels, uh, because you are, you know, completely subservient to uh, the political clout of that industry. And that's really the framework of net zero. And obviously, I'm not blaming uh, the government of India solely for it by any means, but I am blaming the government of India for hopping on to this bandwagon uncritically, as, you know, as are most other governments and big businesses worldwide, you know that uh, uh, allows them to, you know, keep on with business as usual. And coming to the last question, is India um, actually standing up for the rights of the most marginalized uh, in the world? And again, the answer very clearly is no. Uh, because while a lot of the rhetoric from the government of India around global inequalities in emissions, uh, global inequalities in effort in tackling climate change, etc., are right on target. They are they are exactly right. Uh, but at the same point, you know, I, I would I would argue that they are self-serving because. Uh, if the government of India was sincere about its rhetoric, uh, you know, they would align their position with the most climate vulnerable countries. For instance, um, uh, a lot of uh, Pacific Island nations, et cetera, have formed this block of climate vulnerable nations who uh, uh, try to negotiate collectively in these UN climate talks. And, uh, neither is India a part of those formations, and nor does India really align its negotiating positions at uh, uh, the UN Conference of Parties with those countries. And what is so starkly unjust about that is, as Ashish was pointing out, um, a lot of the people in the world who are the most vulnerable to climate change are in fact in India. Uh, if you look at you know, what parts of the world are most affected by extreme temperatures and heat waves that we are, we're already getting and we're going to get you know, a lot more of them in the future, you know, what parts of the world are most likely to be affected by extreme water scarcity and desertification uh, because of climate change, et cetera, you will find that a lot of them are in South Asia, in India and Pakistan. And so by not aligning itself with the most climate vulnerable in the world, the government of India is effectively not standing up for the interests of its own people, which goes right back to uh, what Jayati was saying about how uh, the political structure, the power structure in India is completely aligned with corporate capital within India as against um, the broad masses of India's population. And that brings me to the end, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Basaf. And thank you for answering very crisply those three, those three questions that, that were posed. Um, we have plenty of time now for Q&A. Um, and we have a couple of questions that are already in the, uh, the Q&A. And I, I welcome other people to, to add uh, to that list. And we should be able to cover all of those. Uh, first, uh, though, I want to give uh, the panelists a chance to kind of respond to each other, and perhaps um, they could respond to each other on this question of um, where you see 
uh, the, the greatest possibility of, of India, and you can interpret India as you like, the government, you know, the, the bulk of society, the, the most adversely affected uh, segments of society. Um, where do you see um, the, the greatest likelihood of India moving uh, toward a better position um, on uh, climate and uh, both reducing carbon emissions, but also the, the larger collection of environmental questions. Um, and, you know, again, I'll, I'll leave it up to you how you interpret a better position. But uh, so if you could both respond to other panelists, but also perhaps respond to that question as well. Um, where you think the greatest likelihood of progress in the near term might lie. And I'd like to come back to, to Jayati at the top to see if, uh, if you have some thoughts on that. You know, there are so many possibilities for progress. I think Ashish already highlighted some of them from the grassroots, but even in terms of public policy, there are so many opportunities and possibilities for doing things differently, doing things better. And uh, a lot of them would require, I believe, necessarily a different approach to policymaking, one that does not privilege large capital or seek to constantly incentivize large capital for anything it does, but uses more regulatory processes to control what it does. And that, that has always been, for example, what new deals have done. They have combined uh, recovery based on public investment or public spending with regulation and redistribution. I think the problem in India today is that we have a domestic political economy that is not geared to the interests of ordinary people, unfortunately, and therefore it's also not in, uh, geared to the interests of ordinary people over the medium and longer run, which includes therefore the impact on nature, uh, on the climate, on, on the earth, if you like. And so we would require a dramatic reorientation of the economic strategy, which would cover pretty much all the productive sectors and would necessarily require significantly enhanced public investment in green, if you like, broadly defined uh, green activities, but also much greater regulation. We have deregulated to the point where we are really unable to control both financial markets and other private investment and consumption activities in ways that are deeply damaging and are very unequal. So that combination of public spending oriented to particular directions, uh, massively increased regulation and redistribution, because as I pointed out, inequality is a very big part of the problem, not just in India, but globally, but in India, certainly it's a big and growing part of the problem, even in terms of the climate catastrophe. Uh, since I have the floor, can I just add, you know, there was a very interesting question, I think from Suchitra Balachandran uh, on um, what can people who are based in the US do about all of these issues? And you know, I have, I'm, because I have recently come to the US, I was, I've been teaching here for a year now. I'm actually just uh, interested in answering this question because to be quite honest, I'm absolutely struck by the lack of knowledge, the lack of awareness among even progressive people in the US on some of these basic issues of global inequality and how their own strategies play into and add and accentuate uh, global inequality. So what are the things that they're unaware of? I mean, quite apart from the fact that I find it appalling and abysmal that there isn't much more outcry about the obscene uh, vaccine nationalism that we have seen and the intellectual property rights that prevent the expansion of vaccine production globally, but consider the issues of the lack of climate finance. Here are people squabbling over whether you should spend 100 billion or 200 billion on a particular child grant scheme, but you have absolutely no awareness that the US has failed to meet its own commitment of some $20 billion a year, that's all of climate finance over the last 12 years. I mean, really, why are the progressives not fighting about this? Why are progressives going for a carbon border tax, which is essentially a protectionist device, without talking about compensations, without talking about how, in fact, the developing countries whose exports and employment would be hit would be compensated automatically by such a tax, because there is no such plan. And there is no attempt to think of a plan. 
there is even no attempt to consider the bad environmental implications of good climate mitigation efforts in the developed world. So what do I mean? Uh, I, I'm currently in the Northeast of the United States. Everyone's progressive, everyone's environmentally conscious, everyone's green. So what are the things you do? You buy electric cars, you go in for um, solar panels in your houses, you uh, go in for recycling. Everybody is enthusiastically recycling. None of these people are aware of the massive environmental costs involved in mining for the things that go into the lithium batteries, go into the things that make up the electric cars, go into the things that make the solar, solar panels, what is being done, the devastation that is being wreaked by this mining, which is not necessary, which doesn't have to happen, but it is happening. And it's because basically it's all seen as a silo. I'm being good where I am, rather than seeing it as part of a global network. So I think there needs to be much more awareness on that front. There needs to be much more awareness about recycling. Recycling is exported. All of you who are busy recycling and every Saturday putting your stuff into those lovely, you know, green or blue baskets, it's all exported. And that export is often then, well, not often, always, it's sent to poorer countries and then sorted out in very damaging, polluting and hazardous conditions. And nobody seems to think twice about that. It's not a problem. Everyone's being good in their own little space. There's no... Um, sense of the broader implications of what US policy does. There's a lot of navel gazing, I'm sorry, but I think it's very, very important for progressives in the United States to be aware of the wider global implications of what is being done. One of the reasons why G7 globally has no legitimacy anymore and cannot have legitimacy is because it's not just that the governments themselves are so openly nationalist and worried about themselves and so on, but that there is not enough outcry from the people of these countries about what those governments are doing and how that is adding to not just global inequality, but adding to the worsening of the factors that impact on climate change. So I think really what progressives here can do is just make more people aware of that, including trade unions, including social movements, including your own progressive friends and colleagues. Excellent, thank you, Jayati. Ashish, I, I want to turn to you and, and perhaps um, add this other question from the Q&A. And I appreciate that Jayati answered uh, our first question and, and that you answered it in the chat. Um, but uh, there was a question, are there specific movement groups in India those of us in the global north should be following? Obviously, there are too many to list, but any you would like to highlight. Um, so uh, perhaps you could answer that and also respond to other panelists if, if you have some comments. Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, in terms of your question of what, is there something that has a greater likelihood or possibility of India being uh, more responsible on climate issues? Um, apart from what Jayati spoke about, I think uh, two things that I can think of, uh, one is on agriculture because we have actually this yesterday's budget has put in a, an even bigger uh, subsidy on chemical fertilizers than what used to be the case. One of our biggest uh, budgetary outlays. Um, and of course, it's not very easy to change that overnight, but what could have possibly been happening over the last many years is a phasing out of that and a use of that for shifting to much more climate resilient, organic, biologically diverse farming, which a lot of farmers groups are trying to do, but uh, government support on that is, uh, is pretty poor. Um, there has been recent announcement at trying to support much more what they call natural or uh, sustainable farming. We're not quite sure what that means yet. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see. But that is one thing that could actually have shifted uh, a significant amount of uh, uh, emission causing agriculture to, uh, in fact, climate resilient and climate friendly agriculture. So that's one thing. The second is on decentralized renewable energy. Unfortunately, if you look at uh, what's happening with renewable energy in India, and there's, there are huge projections, there's massive investments going in, etc., including in this latest budget. Um, and a lot of that is also being driven by this whole net zero uh, argument, which Baso spoke about. The problem is, much of that is mega parks, mega solar parks, mega wind parks, etc., And the ecological and the social implications and impacts of that are already being felt where these things are being put up, mostly by the private sector. 
Um, and so instead of that, if there could have been a much greater shift towards decentralized renewable energy, which is in the control of communities uh, where you don't have these kinds of massive uh, impl impacts that are being felt by the mega projects. Um, the one good, possibly good thing that's come in the latest budget is a much greater uh, investment on solar uh, equipment for farmers for pumping water. So instead of using uh, diesel or petrol to actually have solar, um, that doesn't necessarily solve the groundwater problem. That's huge, but it at least in terms of climate, that could be better. Uh, so there are a few things like that, but that could have been, a, and I think is still something if we push really hard on it, uh, these are the two sorts of things which could be fairly significant in the next uh, few years. And they're not, uh, none of them require any very complicated policy or financial or technological things. They're all avail easily available. If, but of course, the government is never going to do it on its own. So there has to be a huge push from people's movements and uh, uh, civil society, et cetera. Um, in terms of the, uh, just to add a quick point on also, I think what uh, Jayati said about, uh, you know, the progressives in the US, which also partly responds to the question that Sujitra uh, raised is, um, I did a critical study of uh, the Bernie Sanders Green New Deal um, which I think in, in, in some ways is actually quite a, a revolutionary document compared to uh, mainstream, what has come from mainstream politics and politicians uh, before that. But it has these really huge blind spots, one of which is what she spoke about, which is the, uh, you know, basically saying all Americans will have electric cars instead of uh, diesel and petrol cars. Sounds great, but you know, it sounds great only because the lithium mining is not going to happen in the US. Or even if it does, if lithium is found there, it'll probably happen in the backyards of uh, blacks and uh, other marginalized communities. So uh, the inequality part of it, the, so the environmental injustice part of it is something that is not yet built into the Green New Deals, either in the US or in Europe, uh, UK, and even South Korea, which is uh, one of, the, I think, the only Asian country that's taken to the so-called Green New Deal. So, uh, and of course, John, I think your sessions have probably been bringing this out quite a lot. Now, uh, in terms of uh, specific movements to follow, <laughs> you rightly said there's lots. One can, you know, fill a few books on that. But um, at a global level, I think the one movement which I at least uh, try to follow a lot, which is, they say at least it's the world's largest social movement is La Via Campesina, which is small farmers, uh, the global movement of small farmers all over the world, several million small farmers. And what's interesting about them is that they're, they managed to combine the very, very local solutions, kind of thing I spoke about, for instance, with the Dalit women farmers, to uh, global advocacy and actions at the level of UN and FAO and things like that, uh, with a very, very strong push on uh, local agroecology, uh, a small smallholder-based agroecology. So La Via Campesina is one. Um, and then I think every once in a while you get these, uh, these incredible movements of either anti-extractivism uh, in different parts of the world or things like the farmers movement that's just uh, been happening in India, right? So uh, there is so much that, so many uh, complex and very inspiring things that are coming out of this, um, out of these sorts of movements that, that would be important to follow. Um, there are there are uh, websites that I can put up where actually there's much more uh, coverage of social movements in different parts of the world. In case uh, you're interested, I, I don't know who asked that question. Sorry, I wasn't following the Q and A, but uh, I could put some up, or I'll put my email, and then the person can also write to me, and I can send more information on that. Excellent, thank you. It was an anonymous uh, question. Oh, okay, we don't know who it was, but um, but thank you. That was that was very helpful. Um, Basaf, there have been a couple of questions actually that have, have come up in the chat um, or in the Q and A, uh, and um, in addition to kind of your reflections on what other panelists have said, and then your reflections on you know uh, points uh, or potential. Um, areas for India in the short term to, to make and have improved policy on climate issues. Um, I want to highlight uh, this question from uh, Katie 
uh, Galagleaf Swan. I don't know if you see it in, in the Q&A, but um, she writes, apparently a similar deal to the Just Transition Partnership between some G7 countries in South Africa is going to be on the table with India this year. Uh, can you speak about the risks and the opportunities of such deals? And then um, she also writes uh, during COP, she heard that the net zero by 2070 was actually an ambitious target for a country of India's size and wealth. Um, so can you comment on this and what needs to change to make an earlier and deeper carbonization realistic? A lot of questions being thrown at you, Basaf. So I'll <laughs> give you some time to, to digest and answer those. Uh, you're Sorry, I was muted. Um, so before I respond to that question, let me quickly follow up on this more overarching question that you raised of, you know, what can India do differently for a just energy transition? And I think um, uh, both Jayati and Ashish covered it very well. Uh, the only additional points I would make are number one, that um, uh, this opportunity for decentralized renewable energy is actually uh, a lost opportunity if you don't, you know, if you don't jump on it and instead, um, uh, instead just go with the centralized power generation and long up, uh, you know, massive lengths of transmission lines, you know, that model of electricity distribution. Uh, and that's because, you know, many parts of rural India, there is not enough connectivity with the grid. And that's actually an opportunity to completely bypass that centralized grid model of development and uh, go with community controlled decentralized renewable energy. And uh, uh, the reasons that uh, a lot of countries in the global south, including India, are not doing that adequately is again because of political ideology, because, uh, uh, you know, if you have centralized energy production, um, you can have uh, corporations controlling it, or even if it's a, a state-owned grid, you, you have more opportunities for corporations to have contracts for massive construction projects, et cetera. So it all goes back to concentration of corporate power. Uh, the other, the other, point I would raise is that uh, as with any other country where there is currently fossil fuel dependency, um, in India as well, unfortunately, uh, there are sectors of the population who have become dependent on uh, fossil fuels for no fault of their own. I mean, the most obvious case being the workers who work in, um, you know, coal mining and power plants and so on and so forth. Uh, but also uh, some of the local communities around these facilities who uh, suffer from the toxic effects, you know, the pollution, etc. but also uh, the you know, the big industrial fossil fuel operations are a major part of the local economy. Uh, so obviously any transition in India as anywhere in the world, uh, both for justice reasons and for political feasibility reasons has to incorporate some form of a just economic transition for the fossil fuel dependent workers and communities. Uh, so uh, the, the union movement in India, for instance, needs to be very involved in this conversation about the transition. 
So um, going on to the question, and let me read Katie's question. Yes, that's actually a fair point. Uh, that that um, uh, for a country of uh, uh, you know India's per capita GDP, etc., uh, 2070 may actually be a realistic date. But then that goes back to the point that Jayati was making about the need for massive climate finance from the global north for um, uh, both the energy transition, meaning climate mitigation, and for um, adaptation to the effects of climate change that are already occurring. Uh, and then there's a third bucket, which is loss and damage, uh, you know, compensation for catastrophic uh, climate events. Now, um, uh, I would, you know, obviously say that there are other far more impoverished countries uh, who should be first in line for that climate finance, but it just goes to show how unequal the world's economic system is that even a country like India, uh, which is not, you know, uh, objectively among the poorest countries in the world, even though uh, there are glaring inequalities within India and there's a uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, large segments of the population of India who are among the world's poorest. But that said, uh, India is not among the poorest countries in the world, but at the same time, uh, just because of the scale of global inequalities, there needs to be international climate finance for India as well for the, uh, this kind of transition. And um, diplomatically, the government of India should be, uh, you know, uh, aligned with other countries of the global south, demanding that kind of climate finance in a fair way uh, for the entirety of the global south uh, to be able to accelerate its own energy transition. Excellent. Thank you, Basaf. Um, we have a bunch of questions, uh, and I'm hoping we can maybe bundle uh, a couple of them together. Um, uh, two kind of specific questions are on uh, solar and on um, kind of switching to agroecology. And uh, let me rephrase them and, and get your responses. Um, on solar, of course, we know the problems of massive solar parks um, and uh, in terms of uh, displacement of people um, and, and potentially being incorporated in kind of a larger corporate uh, entity for energy production. Um, we've heard of the possibility of smaller scale solar, for instance, for pumping water for farmers. There's also the possibility of, say, rooftop solar um, in, in a more distributed, decentralized way. Do we have, either in India or, um, or looking out from India, other kinds of examples of more appropriate uses of, of solar? Um, and then the second question is uh, somewhat related, I suppose, farming, uh, how we can encourage the movement towards more agroecological approaches to farming. And let's focus here on India. Um, India, of course, is a huge uh, uh, producer of food. Uh, there's also incredible amount of resistance coming from, from farmers, as we've seen. Um, how can this be marshaled uh, for India perhaps becoming, you know, uh, a, a model for a different kind of, of farming for the world? Um, so those two questions, farming, solar, um, who would like to, to take a crack first at those? I'll ask 
I think Ashish should start actually because these are right up his alley. I think that's yeah. it. Not necessarily. Let me, yeah, uh, give it a shot, but I'm sure uh, Jayati and Basu can both add much more. So on, uh, I think, Daljeet's question, right, about whether decentralized or distributed renewable energy is feasible for cities. Um, I think there was a Greenpeace India study which showed that for Delhi, as an example, something like 35 to 40 percent of the uh, current electricity needs can be met by a solar rooftop. Right, uh, that's a pretty substantial chunk that we're talking about. That's just one technology that is solar rooftop. We can think of others that could augment that. Uh, but, and I think this is a very important but, unless we also challenge the levels and the kinds of energy consumption in cities, especially by uh, the middle class and upper middle class, let's say the rich, people like me, for instance, right? Um, we're not going to be able to do this. And that is a general thing for the world as a whole. If our energy demands just keep going up and up and up and up, up, there's no, absolutely no renewable energy in the world that will be sustainable. There's no energy source in the world that will be sustainable. So we have to be able to also challenge the consumption patterns, the production, of course, but also the consumption patterns of what we're talking about in our cities. Why are we building buildings which require huge amounts of energy, for instance, whereas we have possibilities for architecture that is much more friendly, uh, you know, much more conducive to the uh, weather and uh, needs much, much, much less electricity. Why do we move, all of us move to uh, electrical appliances in our kitchens where in fact we can be doing half the things just by hand, etc. Now, these are not easy choices. They're not easy things to switch back to because some of them are less convenient or whatever it is. But we have to be able to move to a system of incentives and disincentives and cultural shifts which uh, make this possible. Otherwise, I'm afraid, uh, forget about decentralized. I don't think energy, any, any energy resource is going to be, energy production process is going to be enough to meet uh, the demands of people if they keep rising at a sustainable level. Nothing is going to be sustainable. So I think that's one important thing. Uh, and this is also, by the way, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest missing chunks in all the Green New Deals. Nobody uh, is asking this. Now, for instance, recently there was this news about uh, the uh, crisis in the French nuclear industry, right? And uh, the crisis is not just because in France this is happening, but the crisis is because half of Europe is dependent on the French nuclear energy system. I didn't know that. I only read about it when this crisis happened. And people said, oh gosh, what are we going to do now? And I was thinking, but listen, Europe uses probably at least 10 times more energy than it needs to. Why can't there be a discussion on actually cutting down energy consumption? and therefore reducing or completely eliminating the dependence on French nuclear power. Th that was not part of the discussion, but what was was, okay, how do we revamp the system? How do we create more power uh, sources and so on? The second thing um, on agro on agroecology, one, one big chunk of this I already mentioned, which is the shifting of subsidy from chemical fertilizers to organic. Because one of the biggest problems with shifting to organic and agroecological methods is the availability of uh, uh, organic manure, for instance, or organic forms of fertilizing the soil. This is significantly gone down in many parts of India for various reasons I won't get into. Uh, so the ability to be able to shift from place, uh, you know, from some place where they have to other places or create new forms of organic manuring, etc., is something that would be helped if this subsidy shift happened. But there are lots of other things which are happening which could be supported. Uh, consumer producer relationships. We have some fantastic examples now in several cities, including mine in Pune, where uh, consumers have actually built direct relationships with farmers offering to buy organic produce at rates that are good for the farmers also. You eliminate the middle person or have middle people who are also part of the thing and sensitive to it. Uh, and uh, so I get healthy food and the farmer gets a ready buyback system. Uh, that kind of, uh, and then creating the possibility of thousands and thousands of local farmers markets in our cities so that the nearest farmers are the ones who are able to give us fresh uh, produce and we incentivize organic also as part of that. Uh, that's another very, very big uh, possibility, I think, uh, in India. There are many examples, but many, many more could be there if there was some support to it, policy support uh, or civil society and civil society support. 
Uh, there are many other things I think that are possible, but the agroecological shifts uh, I think can happen within the next uh, five to 10 years in a very big way if some of these uh, policy supports and civil society support, and of course, what the farmers movements are also doing can, uh, can be oriented in these directions. Excellent, thank you. Did uh, Basaf or Jayati want to look at those questions? Because um, there are other questions as well. So we could go on to those if, um, I mean, for instance, Basaf, uh, there is a question here. Your arguments for why India should focus only on decentralized renewables is exactly what the multilateral development banks are forcing on all development countries, especially in Africa, and especially being pushed by the US. So I'm curious how you how you would kind of think about this, this question of decentralized renewables from the perspective of the multilaterals versus perhaps how you would characterize uh, decentralized um, renewables? So first of all, um, I wouldn't actually make the assertion that we have to have only decentralized renewables. Uh, there can certainly be room for uh, you know, larger solar or wind generation facilities, but uh, the, the, the things to remember are number one, how do we maximize decentralized renewables to the extent possible? How do we ensure that the decentralized renewables can be community controlled? How do we ensure that it's not just uh, middle class and affluent homeowners who are able to um, put up solar panels on their rooftops, but that the benefits of owning decentralized renewables is you know, accessible to all of the population. Um, and uh, even the centralized renewable generation that does exist, uh, the land acquisition for it has to be done in a just way uh, that, you know, that, uh, um, um, that uh, takes into account community land rights, et cetera, including principles of uh, uh, free prior and informed consent. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, workers' rights and issues like that. And also, you know, ideally uh, community ownership, public ownership, so that, uh, uh, it's again not large corporations who are benefiting from the um, centralized generation. Um, and with regard to um, uh, multilateral development banks, etc., it's frankly not correct to say that uh, multilateral development banks are exclusively pushing decentralized renewables. If anything, multilateral development banks are continuing to push fossil fuels, uh, which, is, which is not what they've been saying publicly since about 2018, uh, but it's a fact. Uh, they have continued to push fossil fuels and they're doing that in very disingenuous ways, for example, through intermediaries where they are not directly making loans to projects, but they are making loans to banks through the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, which is the uh, private sector lending arm of the World Bank. And then those private banks in turn are uh, making loans to fossil fuel projects. Uh, so, so multilateral development banks are continuing to push fossil fuels. They're continuing to push massive centralized uh, renewable energy production, et cetera. And, uh, and um, to the extent that they are pushing some projects that are decentralized renewables, that's, I would say, at the margins and lip service. Excellent, thank you. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, I, there was a question on uh, for Ashish about the impact of the farmers movement, but I'd actually like to ask Jayati for her thoughts on, on that. Um, you know, this is something that has made it even, you know, not a lot of news from India makes it onto NPR. Um, 
and especially not news from social movements. And so this this is, had a, has made it into the headlines here in the United States. What impact do you think it will have on, on India's kind of overall uh, policy making, climate wise, of course? You know, the, the farmers movement is a fascinating thing, but it's also a very complicated one. Uh, because uh, as you would imagine, it represents a whole diversity of different kinds of farmers' interests and so on. Many of the demands that have been made over the last three years are uh, not just terrific, but are also aware of the ecological problems, the problems of land rights of those who have been traditionally denied, the forest dwellers, the problems of women farmers. So they have brought in many, many different issues. At the moment, it's often being identified that the, that the farmers are really seeking only a few uh, things. They're seeking minimum support price guarantees. They're seeking, you know, the, of course, the withdrawal of the farm laws on which they were successful, but a few other very simple things. I think that would not be fair to the complexity of the demands of the farmers movement. There was a question in there or a comment, I think, about how the farmers movement has been explicitly against agroecology. I don't think that's true. I think within that farmers movement, there have been many farmers and groups of farmers who have been recognizing the importance of agroecology and of more environmentally sustainable technologies being available to them. But I think there is one point about agroecology, which while I completely agree with uh, Ashish that that is the way of the future, it needs much more public support. It's not going to happen without public support. It is not viable. These are heavily employment intensive, very, very re requiring much more additional labor. And there need you need a much more holistic approach of public support systems. So for example, you could think of the Rural Employment Guarantee Act, the work on that uh, being enabling things like national natural pesticide management, uh, which would provide natural pesticides to farmers. Uh, you need you know, for natural fertilizers, you need much more, it, these are deeply employment intensive. So you need much more associated activities that would actually come in and enable farmers to do this. It's very, very difficult for individual farmers to do this and survive in what is, let's not uh, uh, read, uh, mince words, it's not just a difficult activity with growing risks, but it's a cutthroat activity in which prices are always against you and the global trade pattern doesn't help. And where India's liberalized trade pattern makes it even worse. So we really do have to think of a much wider system of protection of agroecology, which includes not just fiscal support, but a range of other government interventions and combining different com uh, government interventions to enable agroecology to flourish on the decentralized uh, thing. First of all, let's be very clear. The ADB dominantly, in terms of energy investments, the Asian Development Bank still dominantly supports brown investments. So let's be very clear about that. Yes, a few very highly publicized cases here and there. The World Bank too. Yeah, a few publicized cases. But broadly, the multilateral development banks are still hugely supporting coal investments, other, th uh, other um, in brown investments in general. Okay, and furthermore, the financial markets are doing much worse. Private financial markets, bond markets, etc. They're hugely supporting brown investments, and there is no regulatory practice to prevent this. Um, I have actually looked at the ADB, and I've been uh, working with ADB on this, so I do know about this one. Chair, but please, uh, you know, don't just quote some random person. I do happen to have followed these data. Okay, uh, however, decentralized. You know, there's nothing wrong with decentralized. It depends on the contest and the and that some of decentralized is actually essential. Where there are difficulties of location, where there are difficulties in accessing land, because you need huge amounts of land if you want lots and lots of solar panels, for example. So definitely, decentralized energy investments have an important place. And I don't think we should say, you know, we reject them simply because U.S. government is supposedly promoting them in verbiage, by the way, in rhetoric not necessarily in practice. So yes, decentralized, I, I mean, I know that in Africa, they are desperately seeking investment, which they're not getting for decent, because the costs have plummeted for decentralized for solar panels and, and so on. So I think we have to be recognizing that we need a multiplicity, a rainbow, as Ashisha said, uh, I call it multicolored global new deal, I think is the same thing, but we need a multiplicity of different forms of investment uh, in different places, according to context, we shouldn't be saying 
we oppose or support anyone in any particular case, but clearly we have to be thinking of these alternatives and we have to be enabling these alternatives because otherwise if we simply say it has to be going on exactly as, as it has been, we're never going to get anywhere. Excellent, thank you. Thank you all. I mean, this has been a, a wonderful conversation. Your presentations were, were crisp and, and informative. Your answers to the questions also very informative. Um, I promise to uh, copy this chat and, and also send out the, the link to the video for folks who wanna get, you know, follow up on the links as well as share the um, information uh, that was contained in this video. Um, I will, uh, my colleague Netva has put up uh, a link to upcoming IPS events, uh, how you can sign up for our event newsletter. Of course, if you'd like to donate to us, it's always welcome. Um, I'll put in the chat as well, one final link to our uh, Global Just Transition Project, where you can find out how to register for our next event, which is on Latin America and the impact of Green New Deals on the Global South, especially Latin America, following up on a lot of the issues we've raised here in terms of the mining of lithium for electric cars in the North, as well as other impacts that uh, a, a largely global North energy transition will have on supplier nations elsewhere in the world. But once again, thank you so much, uh, Basaf, Ashish, Jayati, for your comments and your presentations. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation in other forums in the future. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you very much. This was a great event. Thank you. Thanks, Jayati and Basaf. See you again soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's what you found. <laughs>